Hello everyone, this is Mary Gregory with MAS Coding Solutions. How is everyone today? I tell you, it is a beautiful hot day here in Charlotte, North Carolina. You know, in North Carolina, the humidity is something. That, well, my grandson uh, is, um, well, he's out of college right now for summer break. Well, he's uh, at FAMU uh, in Tallahassee, Florida. And he, he says that the humidity here cannot be compared to what's in Florida. So, where are you, wherever you are today, I do hope all is well with you. Today, you know, we are all about being a critical thinking coder. What does that mean? Well, you know, you are a coder that accepts responsibility. You are a coder that has resiliency and resolve. You are a coder that is resourceful. I am always, even though I've been coding a long time, I'm still amazed at how when you, I'm an independent coder. So I take coding assignments from different um, people that offer me coding assignments. I'm trying to cut back on that. But what I'm always amazed at is this. People say, oh, that Mary or Susie or... Catherine, they're a really great coder. But you know, sometimes what they really mean is that they are a dependable coder. See, they de they dependable. They show up on time. Uh, they do their work. I am amazed at the number of coders that appears to be uh, kind of, I, I need another word for cheating, but cheating on their time. They'll sign in to work, and they'll say they worked eight hours and did three charts. That's not right. We as coders, we are professionals, and, and we want to have a good reputation. So, but anyway, a lot, of, a lot of times being a great coder, being a critical thinking coder, sometimes it's not just about you putting the right codes on the encounter, but it's also about how you show up. You do. You put the right codes on. You come in. You clock in on time, or sit down at that computer on time. You know, a lot of people say they want to be a remote coder, but I'm gonna tell you something. That takes an awful lot of discipline to be a remote coder. You have to sit there in that in that chair, looking at that computer for eight hours. Of course, you know you take breaks. Um, there may be times when your family want to go to the park, but you got a code. Yes, you're at home, but you got a code. So when you think about being that great critical thinking coder, think about your work ethics as well. But anyway, I don't know why I got into that, but I hope it will serve its purpose and bless someone today. Today, we're going to be talking about coding tools. Now, some of you all may have been coding for years. Some of you all may be new to the profession. And now, when you are a new coder, you do not necessarily get to sit in a room with other people. They may train you over uh, the internet. That's how your training may go. And you are going to be using tools in that training. And I think it's good for you to have a good basic understanding of those tools. Now, when I started traveling as a, a contract coder, man, we had to carry books. We had to, oh my God, reference material. We had to carry all that. I actually had a little portable hand truck that I took with me. It folded up real pretty uh, that I could put underneath the plane. Because when I would get to my destination, just sometimes, especially in a large airport, I would have to walk a mile or two just to get to the next location or get to the rental car location. And so I had to get me a hand truck to be able to carry all those books. Well, see, now you don't have to do that. Everything is electronic for you now. And these are great tools. But remember, they are just tools. So let's talk about, there's three types of tools that I think coders use a lot. Now, of course, there's some more, but these are the ones that you want to use in your everyday coding. 
if you work for a physician office maybe or you're working in an outpatient arena uh, maybe amateur surgery centers whatever the case may be you may use a tool that's just a simplified electronic code book it's just a code book like in electronic format that's all it is you can have your icd 10 cm in electronic format you have your PCS in electronic format. You have your CPT in electronic format. You have your HixPix Level 2 in electronic format. You can even have your medical dictionary in uh, electronic format. These are coding tools. That's a coding book. So you do not have to have a book. Now, personally, I have a book. Uh, I'm a consultant. I like having a book. So uh, today, like today, I have my CPT book with me. See, my CPT book, Professional Edition 2022. But you don't have to have this book. It can be electronic for you. But guess what? You still have to know the coding guidelines for CPT. You still got to know your coding guidelines for ICD-10, CM, or PCS. And so the book just helps you to find the code. Your book, that electronic book, just keep me from having to write this big book everywhere that I go. Okay? Now, in, when you work in a facility, you also have an extra tool that we use. And it's called an encoder. Well, what is an encoder? Your encoder is actually a software that will take your diagnosis and procedures that you have coded and it can assign it to a payment methodology. Now, if you are an inpatient coder or you want to learn to be an inpatient coder, then your encoder will assign a MSDRG. It can also assign, um, uh, let's see, what, uh, APR DRG. Okay? Now, if you are doing outpatient as a facility and you have an encoder, it can also assign uh, your APC uh, payment methodology. So your encoder has a code book within it. It does. It has all the code books within it. Uh, but it has that one extra special piece. And that is it can take your codes that you have assigned and assign it to a payment methodology. Then that could be an APR DRG, that could be an MSDRG, that can be an APC. It can even do um, risk adjustment. See, so you can have a coding electronic coding book, but it will not generate a payment for you. You have to have an encoder to generate the payment. Okay, there are several out there, you know, whatever you start with tend to be your preference. Uh, some people started with 3M, some people started with Optum, some people started with TrueCode. It, it's probably some out there I don't even know about. So that encoder, but remember this, the encoder is only as good as you are. If you don't know the guidelines, if you code inaccurately that encoder will not always fix it for you it will not fix it now what the encoder does is it will give me a hint it, may, it give me an edit i should say a hint let's say edit because that's what you'll see now on that edit it'll tell me it'll say mary you have coded an i10 which is hypertension with an N18, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, or 9. That is chronic kidney disease. Those are the stages. And it will tell me when I have an I10 and an N18, hey, this I10 is not correct. You need a different hypertension code. So I would change that I10 to an I12. And then it, the edit will go away. But guess what? It won't tell me if I have an N18 and I do not code an I10, I do not code a hypertension code, 
that system not going to tell me, hey, Mary, you missed your hypertension code. It doesn't do that. See, it only gives you edits based on what you have coded. It's not, it, it's just not going to give you a nice little hint out the blue. See, so your encoder is only as good as you are. And another thing uh, the encoder won't do, it will not assign your principal or primary diagnosis. You have to do that. And you have to do that based on the coding guidelines. So you might say, well, what do you mean, Mary? What do you mean by that? Okay, once again, so my patient come in, and let's say the patient come in with a hip fracture. But they also got a urinary tract infection. Now, the hip fracture really was the driver of my patient coming. The urinary tract infection just coexisted at the time of that admission. But guess what? If I put the urinary tract infection first and then the hip fracture, I'm not going to get an edit saying, hey, wait a minute, the hip fracture needs to go first. I'm not going to get that. It's just going to say, okay. See, now, if I have, if I accidentally, because they do have coders, that was one of the things I put on my note. You know, you can get a job with some of these organizations, helping them with this, these edits and helping them to write these programs. Because the IT person may know how to write the program, but they don't know about coding. They don't know about coding guidelines. That's where you come in at, see. And so uh, I may have a case where I accidentally put a manifestation code first. Now, manifestation code, as you all know, is a code that can never be in the primary or the principal slot. So let me, so I put the manifestation code first. Guess what? That encoder gonna say, no, you cannot do that. Because see, now they do have edits out there. They have good edits. Don't get me wrong, there's some good edits. So that edit will pop up and say, no, no, Mary, this cannot be your principal. Now I go back and I'm like, man, I missed it. Yeah, that's right. I'm supposed to change this around. See? So there are some things it can help you with. But ultimately, you are the coder. You have the documentation. It's your responsibility to code it correctly. And the last one is called the Computer Assisted Coding. C as in cat, A as in apple, C as in cat. Uh, I'd like to call it the CAD, but they said don't say that, okay? Well, you know me, I'm always a, sometimes a little bit of a rebel, so I say it anyway. But it's computer-assisted coding. Well, what is computer-assisted coding? Well, my basic understanding is that it's written in what they call a natural language processing. And that system, once again, they got to have you, the coder, they got to have someone that know coding, because they're going to write edits. And so this system goes through the physician documentation and it can pull codes out. Yeah, it, it has what they call suggestive codes. But once again, sometimes those suggestive codes are not right. I noticed with one particular system, they put all the suggestive code in alphabetical order. If you got something in uh, chapter 1, which is A, says sepsis, A41. Well, they're going to put that first. Well, sepsis may not have been first, but C is A. Then if you have anything in B, if you have anything in C, you have anything in J. So this CAC, the computer system coding, will not put things, will not put the principal diagnosis in the right slot. That's your job. But it, it'll tell you what it, what it is. I mean, if it got sepsis, they're going to pick up sepsis. You got a pneumonia, that thing can pick up pneumonia. But it can also pick up things that the patient don't have. For instance, I was coding a chart. And as you grow in your coding, you'll begin to notice things. And so this was not a very sick patient. And they had a cardiac, the suggested, the CAC had suggested a cardiac arrest code. And I thought, huh? 
a cardiac arrest. There was nothing in this chart about this patient being that sick. But of course, you know, sometimes people have cardiac arrest unexpectedly. So I said, I better, I'm going to check this out because I'm the coder. I'm just not going to accept any code just because that CAC put it out there. And so what had happened was the patient was a DNR, a do not resuscitate, okay? Or some people call it DNI, do not intubate. And so they said, uh, DNR, do not, do not resuscitate for cardiac arrest. Well, see, the system saw that word cardiac arrest and had it as a suggested code. But see, the patient didn't have a cardiac arrest. He was just saying, hey, this patient is a DNR. If they have a cardiac arrest, we are not to resuscitate the patient. So you are the coder. You cannot just accept every code that they suggest. You have to look at your documentation and you are going to refuse some of those codes. And you're not going to put the principal code, your principal diagnosis, that they have as a first code. You're not going to do that because that may not be your principal. Remember, for inpatient admission, the principal diagnosis as, is defined as that condition established after the study to be responsible for occasioning the admission to the hospital. In, and when you're doing outpatient, you're at the physician office, you, it's the same thing. What brought the patient to the office? That patient may have COPD chronically, and that's a J44. But maybe he really coming in because he had a fractured finger. Well, guess what? My CAC going to have the J44 first because it's a J. It going to have the S as the second code. But the S code, the fracture, the, the fracture is really what drove the patient to the house, to that physician office. And that has to be primary. And also, when you're working in a facility, now the CAC can also talk to your encoder. So once you selected all your codes from that CAC, you agree with them, you, you're looking at your documentation. Now, once again, you're going to put those codes in the order that they belong, and your encoder is going to assign that MSDRG, APRDRG, risk adjustment, whatever it needs to do for you. Okay, that was a long one today, but I, feel, I really feel that we needed to talk about that. Uh, I want you to have a great understanding about your coding tools, what they can and cannot do. So this is Mary signing out. I'm getting ready to sign off today from beautiful Charlotte, North Carolina. Look forward to talking to you soon. Don't forget to follow me on LinkedIn. I'm doing some great things. Uh, Facebook. Uh, Instagram, I'm still working on Instagram people. We do some things, but it's not where I wanted to be, okay? <laughs> but we're out there. Uh, and we our website, www.mascodingsolutions.com. Look, have a great rest of the month, whatever. And look, coders get paid to think. <laughs>